uh, I go back with you to 82. The Bill Clements campaign. Yeah, 82. The one I lost. <laughs> we all lost it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you guys came back in 86 and won. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. there in 86. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just there for a kind of a, a cameo appearance. Yeah. They, uh, but Carl, uh, you know, uh, we've talked time to time. You know, I have great respect for what you're doing. And I put money with you, and uh, thank you, and thank all, you. and uh, but what do we got now? This has got to be the strangest bird. I'm not talking about person. I'm just talking yeah. about yeah. it's a strange yeah. animal yeah. that yeah. we have yeah. in this campaign. Yeah, uh, we've never had as many candidates seeking the Republican nomination in our history, going back to 1856. Never had so many qualified candidates. No and, way I remembered. It was kind of they were picked before. The thing started. Yeah, back, well, back then they would they they'd show up at the convention and, uh, through 1896. They would show up at the convention. So there'd be a front runner, a couple of other people. Nobody'd have a majority of the delegates. The boys would get in the back room, smoke a few cigars, drink a little bit of whiskey, and arrive at an agreement. But it would generally take multiple ballots to get there. Uh, between 1856 and 1896, the first 50 years of the Republican Party, the only conventions. That have one you ballot. You said 1856 to 1996. It's 1896. Uh, the first, the first 40 years of the party. Okay, 1896 to. Well, 1856, the founding of the Republican Party, to 1896. Okay. The election of William McKinley. The only one ballot conventions are the conventions that renominate someone. If you're nominating a, a an open uh, race, like in 1880, it took 36 ballots to nominate James A. Garfield. Uh, and that, 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 that multiple ballot convention uh, was broken in 1896 by the first modern presidential primary campaign mounted by William McKinley. But and that's. He, and he walked into the convention. McKinley's the one that you wrote the book yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great book. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks. I'm, uh, thanks. The, uh, okay, then, I mean, here we are. We got more candidates yeah. than we've ever had. Yeah. And, and they don't any of them go away. Yeah. No, well, they'll start to go away because what's going to happen is there'll be a process of winnowing. Um, there, there's only so many times you can come in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. Well, you run out of money. You, dry, you run out of money. We'll have a couple that will dry up after Iowa, and we'll probably have a couple more that will dry up after, uh, after New Hampshire, and maybe one or two more after South Carolina. My sense is this race has great potential to get down to two or three candidates by March 15th, which is when we start voting winner-take-all states. And, and if on that day, March 15th, somebody wins Florida and Ohio, the two biggest blocks of delegates up that day uh, in all likelihood they're the nominee okay now the only subject you know i'm fluent on <laughs> is energy and uh do uh do uh is energy going to be a factor in this or could it be oh, I, I hope it is because what i think it is is an opportunity for the republican candidate to strike a couple of notes one a note of optimism about the country because they can point to the success of america in becoming energy independent the government didn't do it uh, foreign countries didn't do it for us. It was American know-how, American ingenuity that has brought on the fracking revolution and is making us energy independent. And so we can herald that. And, and what we can do is the right candidate, if they're smart, will stand up and say, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to revitalize our manufacturing base. As you said, cheap domestic energy Unbel trumps. Unbelievable. Trump, yeah, tr chumps, trumps cheap foreign labor. And so we got an opportunity for somebody to stand up and go to places like, look, I've been in Northeast Ohio, Timken uh, ball bearings. You talk to those guys at Timken and they're competing with, you know, they, they, they export to China because the Chinese can't copy their work and because of cheap domestic energy to, to power and, our manufacturing. And, and Ohio's got it. And well, and they've had coal and now they got natural gas. And so now they're able with assurance to say, look, we got a clean energy source here coming online. So let's build more of our plants in the U.S. And, and, um, and anyway, a Republican candidate can stand up and say, we got a shot to reinvigorate our domestic manufacturing basis, but we also have a chance to stop spending money in, in a part of the world where they dress funny and don't like us. And they can also say, by God, we can start having people dependent upon us. Just like people have been worried for decades about what's going on in the Persian Gulf, they will start currying favor with us because we can supply the energy they need. Okay, uh, the, uh, here you are. There's no way that oil can compete with natural gas as far as clean. Mm -hmm. It, right. won't, it right. just won't work. Right. It's not possible. Uh, the uh, Volkswagen people 
they came up with a way to do it. Yeah, it was called uh, messing around with their software, <laughs> so it gave up phony results on their <laughs> diesel cars. That's right. Yeah. And so that really has hurt diesel. Yeah. And Cummings is so advanced on how... They manufacture the truck engines. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they are way out front. Yeah. And those guys have uh, they've got an engine, a 9-liter, nine, nine 12-liter coming up, but has 90% less NOx emissions. Yeah. It's unheard of. Yeah. It's cleaner than the grid. Yeah. Okay, all of that is going to come to the surface, and a lot of things are going to change in energy, yeah. I'd yeah. say, within the next five years. But you think it could be an issue. I, a smart person would make it an issue. I mean, you know, look, the economy, there are going to be two big issues driving the election national security and the economy. The economy almost always is the most important issue. National security because of ISIS and because of you know, um, the, the, the incidents around the world is going to be an important issue, but the economy is a driver of it. And a smart candidate is going to say, this is a way for us to get better jobs. Sure, you got, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to move jobs back this way. Yeah, but it it's already happening. Think the, about how long we went without new refineries, and now people are talking about expanding existing facilities or even building new ones. Well, okay, uh, we're in agreement on that. But, you know, it, 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 we've been around a long time. I, we're usually in agreement on most things. Yeah, I'm and smart enough to know that. that you're, I you're smarter than I am is what you said. <laughs> no. And I, catch, <laughs> and I catch on. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, but, okay, I, I touched on your book. Yeah. yeah how are sales going? Uh, uh, Mr. Simon and Mr. Schuster seem to be very happy with them, so I'm I'm happy. You're getting rich again. So well, no, right. actually, I'm I'm earning back my advance. See, they they have to pay me and pay me in advance, and then I have to earn it back for them. So they, I I know a little bit about that. You know, I had a couple of books. Uh, people sell them, get rich off books. Yeah, no, they don't. <laughs> they don't. But I had a lot of fun. It was a, well, you have a chance to show your intellectual, uh, you know, uh, how smart you are. No, my and, passion for history. And you are. Yeah, you yeah, are a historian. Yeah, you truly are. Industry. You know what, though? It's got an Oklahoma connection. One of the one of the guys who I wrote about William McKinley in the election of 1896 and how history gets him wrong and how history gets the election wrong. And the guy who is the modern American historian who stood up and said exactly that after nearly 100 years of misinterpreting McKinley was a professor at the University of Oklahoma, H. Wayne Morgan. And he, he, he died. He was a well-known guy. He was a well-known yeah. guy. And uh, he died two years ago. But before, I, I was writing my book, and I called him up out of the blue, and he couldn't have been more helpful. And for about a year, I'd send him things. He'd give me advice and counsel. And uh, I dedicated the book to him and three other historians who've helped revitalize McKinley's reputation. But, I mean, it, McKinley, it, nobody knows him. I mean, we honor JFK for PT-109. We honor... 40 Bush, H.W. Bush for uh, enlisting in the Navy at the age of 18, becoming a fighter pilot. No. A, a, a bomber pilot. That's Torpedo right. bomber pilot. Yeah, he was, uh, what was that plane called? Anyway, it was, it yeah. was a bomber. Well, it, it, what it was, a torpedo. Torpedo bomber, bomber yeah. yeah. So, but McKinley enlists in the military at the age of 18 as a private in the 23rd Ohio and fights through the entire Civil War and emerges as a major, having received three battlefield commissions for unbelievable valor. He is recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he discourages his comrades from pressing the application, saying, I only did my duty. And he's a remarkable man who runs the first modern presidential primary, the first modern presidential election, is the first candidate of either party in the primary season, nomination battle, to openly ask for the support of blacks. He goes to a church in Savannah, Georgia, and a meeting with black leaders in Jacksonville, Missis uh, Jacksonville, Florida, in March of 1895, and no candidate for president has ever done that. Well, he was a leader, no question, yeah. but he, he hasn't been recognized yeah. as a leader right. until you wrote the book. But when he was assassinated, was when? 1896? No, September 1901. He, gets, he serves a very successful first term. Uh, the economy, is, uh, which had been in deep depression, suddenly bursts into prosperity. He, fa he annexes uh, Hawaii. He fights a short, uh, popular war with Spain, and we end up with Puerto Rico, a free Cuba, and the, and the Philippines. He helps bring about the sort of the first efforts to rein in uncompetitive practices of the, of the business trust. But when he dies, he dies and he's reelected in, in, in 1900, picks a young running mate, 40-year-old um, uh, New Yorker named Theodore Roosevelt, governor of New York, 
Okay, now, you know where Roosevelt was when McKinley was assassinated? He was hunting, uh, and uh, he'd take, McKinley is shot. Everybody believes that he's going to, he's on the mend. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt goes hunting in the Adirondacks. He is literally miles away from uh, any uh, from any transportation. And there, a telegram is sent that the president is fading, and he uh, literally rides a horse in the middle of the night to catch a train in, in the Adirondacks, and, and arrive shortly after. Uh, Where was it? He caught the train. Uh, I, I, I used to know that, like. Tinderl, uh, New York, or something. I've been there. Glen is it? Glen uh, Glen, Lake. Glen Lake, Glen Echo, or Glen Lake? Yes, yeah, it's like Glen that. Lake. I think yeah, I've yeah. been there, <clears throat> and there is a plaque there yeah. at the train station yeah. saying yeah. this is where Roosevelt boarded the train to go to Washington. Well, McKinley is enormously popular as death. In fact, we don't know how popular he was. I mean, just enormous outpouring of grief. He's killed by a terrorist, an anarchist kills him, and can, and admits ISIS. Him. Uh, no, the sort of the pre-ISIS ISIS. These are a group, an international group of anarchists that attempted to kill the Tsar of Russia. They killed the Empress of Austria-Hungary. They attempted to kill, and in some instances, kill the President of France, the President, the Prime Minister of Spain, Prime Minister of Italy. They even made an assassination attempt on the Pope. That a guy with a knife in the Papal Gardens. But when they kill McKinley, the nation it, it grieves enormously. Five hundred thousand people line the railroad tracks between Buffalo and Washington. When the train, it, it was like Reagan. Yeah, when he died. yeah. When when the train comes plowing into burying his body, comes plowing into Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to take on water, thirty thousand people have jammed the railroad station. So many people that the governor of Pennsylvania cannot force his way through the crowd to pay his respects to Mrs. McKinley. And when the train pulls out of the station, they all begin spontaneously singing "God Bless America." The tracks and leading into the Baltimore station have been lined with. With uh, for several hundred yards, with huge mounds of flowers that the citizens of Baltimore have come and thrown on the tracks, and the train comes plowing into the station covered with rose petals and flower petals. Dawn falls when the train pulls out of Baltimore, and a reporter who's riding on the train is deeply moved by the vision between Baltimore and Washington. Every hundred yards or so is a bonfire lit in the uh, lit in a, a farmer's field, and and standing at the uh, are the farm families, many of them poor blacks with their uh, hands over their hearts, uh, heads, uh, you know, hats off their head as their fallen chief comes by. He's finally buried uh, two days later in Canton, Ohio, in, the, in a receiving vault. They, they haven't had time to prepare a sarcophagus for him. 16,000 people march into the cemetery, led by the military and veterans. And the school children of Nashville, Tennessee. Veterans would be veterans so of the Civil, Civil War. War. He's yeah. the last Civil War president. And the school children of Nashville, Tennessee, have sent sweet pea flowers, trainloads of sweet pea flowers that have been strewn on the path. And you have this image of grizzled Civil War veterans reaching down, plucking the flowers, putting them in their lapels. The entire cabinet is there, many of them openly weeping. Roosevelt, the new president, is standing apart from How old is he? He's 40 years old. So and he's younger than some of these guys running right oh yeah, now. Yeah, and uh, he's standing there apart from his cabinet because he's so overcome with emotion that he thinks that if he sits with them, he won't be able to control himself. I've been to this site. Behind the site of where of the receiving vault, which is still there, is a ridge that runs about 500 yards, about 50 feet tall. And I have pictures of it. Ridge? A ridge, a ridge line right behind in the You're cemetery. Right. It was a rock, uh, rock ridge. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a soil. It's, but it's uh, it not man-made. Not man-made. Naturally occurring ridge yeah. line, and it was grassy. And on the ridge line, the entire uh, ridge line is lined with floral tributes. Now, some of them are from like the Tsar of Russia and the President of Argentina, but most of them are gigantic floral tributes from working people. You know, there's an enormous wreath uh, from the from the tin men of East Liverpool, Ohio, and the then there'll be a you know from the miners from the miners of. Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, and from the men of the Homestead uh, Iron Smelter, uh, number one, uh, you know, uh, all these oh, working that people. Made it, it got everybody. Got everybody, and he was yeah. he was thought he was thought of as a president who'd return the country to prosperity and an outpouring of grief for the guy, and 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 today largely forgotten, in part because the historians who came along in the 1920s and 30s, who were writing about that era, saw more in William Jennings Bryan. Than they saw in McKinley. They liked William Jennings Bryan's ideology. They were progressive historians. They liked what he had to say more than they liked what McKinley had to say. So they downplayed McKinley, made him appear like he's the 
tool of his campaign manager, <laughs> Marcus Alonzo Hanna, and played up it the guy. It hasn't changed that much, has it? Well, it has. It has. <laughs> it, you know, the politics back then look a lot like today. I mean, we the political system before McKinley's broken. We have five presidential elections in a row in which nobody gets fifty percent of the vote. Two presidents during that time are elected with majority in the electoral college, but they lose the popular vote. Another candidate wins the Electoral College and has a plurality victory over his Democrat opponent, 7,000 votes nationwide. And there, there's divided government. 20 out of the 24 years, there's, there's a, a president of one party in Congress is held by at least one or both houses are held by the other party. And they don't get anything done. And along comes McKinley. And they don't get anything done. They don't get anything done. <laughs> There's a similarity. There's a sim well, in fact, it's worse. It makes today look like kumbaya. 1890. Republicans take the House. They're sworn in in 1891. They begin to meet, and the Democrats say, we will, not, we will use a parliamentary trick and deny the ability of the Congress to take, take up a single bill. And they do so by refusing to answer the roll call, denying the House a quorum. They'll be so there they, on the never floor. Get, they can't get a quorum. So after a couple of days, Thomas Brackett Reed is the speaker, about six foot, three inches tall, 300 pounds. Well, he starts whipping guys. No, what he does is he simply says to the clerk at the end of the roll call, he says the chair directs the clerk to show Mr. Jones present, Mr. Smith present, Mr. Martin present, Mr. Fall present. And a Democrat stands up and says, under God and the Constitution, you have no right to count me present on the floor. And Reed says... The chair is merely stating a fact. Does the honorable gentleman from Kentucky deny he's present on the floor of the House? This kicks off a three-month-long battle <laughs> to figure out whether or not he has the parliamentary right to do this. The, on, the, on one of the first days of the debate— well, I, bet, I bet he won. He won, but it took him three months to win. The, the, and, and, it, and it was acrimonious. The, the, one, in one of the first days of the debate, Congressman William Henry Howdy Martin of Texas stands up and points to him and says, will any member order me to remove this dictator from his position upon the podium? And I will do so by force forthwith. And how, Reed, how big was he? Six foot, six inches tall, thin as, thin <laughs> as a rail, mean, mean as a snake, fought through the entire Civil War with Hood's Brigade. And Reed, very cool customer, says, the honorable gentleman from Texas is out of order. Martin was so irritated that he started showing up every day thereafter, taking a seat right in front of, of Reed at the podium, pulling out his 16-inch long Bowie knife and methodically sharpening it on his boot heel in an attempt to menace Reed during the debates. Didn't work. He lost. <laughs> oh, Carl, you have you have way too much information. Yeah, way too much. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Okay, thanks for being on my podcast. There we go. What the heck is a podcast? Bro? I don't know for sure. I'm going to find out. Though. <laughs>